Making the NBA is the dream of just about every high school player. A future of playing basketball on the biggest stage adored by millions of fans, making all the money you could ever imagine, friends all around you, personal relationships you never thought were attainable, trips around the world, taking care of your loved ones, and so much more are all there for the taking if you can be good at putting a ball in a hoop. But getting there is arguably not even half the battle, and the fall from grace if things do not work out is something that is often impossible to imagine for those of us lucky to have never experienced it. Hello everyone and welcome back to my Whatever Happened To series where we take a deep dive into the lost basketball careers of noteworthy people. For those of you who have been around for a while, first off, thank you. And second, you probably realize that this is actually a remake of a video I did a few years ago. That video has since been removed from the channel due to the quality of it no longer meeting my expectations along with certain details being left out that I wish I could go back and add. So starting today, I will be remaking certain videos going forward along with plenty of new content. Now, real quick before we get started, please do me a big favor and like the video as it helps me out much more than you guys realize. Now, let us begin by asking the question, what has happened to Robert Swift's NBA career? As most of you should know if you found this channel, the later 90s and early 2000s NBA was a whole different animal. The game was played differently from how it is today. Some people yearn for this era to make a return, some are glad that we have evolved as a human species. Personally, I feel as though I lay somewhere in the middle. Fast-paced scoring is definitely fun to watch, but physicality on both sides of the ball I wish could make a return. I love seeing long threes that make you question what more a defender could do, but I miss seeing more team-focused half-court sets where the ball moves inside and out. It is also great that players have the ability to voice their opinions on world events as this creates avenues for those less informed to better understand what's going on beyond their backyard. But a lot of the time these basketball guys simply don't know Bo Diddley squat about world issues and should probably keep their mouth shut. And of course, it is nice being able to check up on the NBA at a moment's notice on my phone or computer rather than using the newspaper a full day behind, which is a little bit of a testament to how old I am. Another detail of the current league that no longer exists is that of the prep to pro concept. That being where a high school basketball phenom makes the jump immediately to the NBA out of high school. Sure, personally, I feel as though this should be permitted. As an adult, you should be able to work as an adult, just as anyone else would in any other profession. But the league did initiate the one and done rule for an understandable reason. Many 18 year olds thought either for themselves or more likely were being pushed by agents, family and friends to make the leap of faith to the NBA before they were physically or honestly, more importantly, emotionally ready. The idea of guaranteed millions as a teenager is very hard to pass up on. But for most of these prepped pros, this doomed their careers and for some of them, their lives. That is where we get to today's story, the tragic tale of Robert Swift. Robert Swift was born in 1985 and raised in California. He broke onto the national scene in 2003 during his junior year at Garces Memorial High School, thanks to his NBA size, length, solid fundamentals and soft touch with both catching and passing. At this time, Robert already stood an intimidating 7 foot 1, putting him a whole head above most players' age. It was during his junior year that his school's team broke onto the national scene as they made the USA Today Top 25 list for the entire country. Robert led the team averaging an impressive 19 points, 11 rebounds, and 4 blocks per game. He was one of the country's best up-and-coming true centers back in an era where the big man was very highly sought after. As a result of these accomplishments, Rob received a lot of praise and attracted the attention of many prestigious high schools and college programs in the area. He announced his intention to attend the University of Southern California in 2003, and around the same time, and in a somewhat controversial decision at the time, Rob transferred to the larger basketball powerhouse that was Highland High School during the spring of his junior year in order to play with them for his upcoming senior year. But after spending several months, including the summer, practicing with the team leading up to the school year, right before classes began, Rob opted to transfer again to Bakersfield High School. 
The exact reasons for this transfer are unclear of us because we are outside of the loop, but if I had to speculate, I would theorize that perhaps the on-court fit was not what was anticipated prior to the move to Highland, or maybe there were some under-the-table dealings that were made to the family, including the hiring of a lawyer in order to get the late transfer approved. Whatever the reason, Swift had himself an exceptional senior year. At Bakersfield, he averaged an impressive 18 points, 15 rebounds, and 6 blocked shots per game. But these numbers failed to paint the complete picture, as articles written around this time described many of Rob's teammates as being jealous of the attention he was receiving. They intentionally would freeze him out of the offense as they sought getting their own points. Playing in packed gymnasiums with college and pro scouts alike watching your every move often can make young players selfish. It has even been said that Rob, despite the size and skills he possessed, was actually rather shy and a bit awkward. Bakersfield is largely an African-American populated school. Rob was one of the only white kids on the team. Plus, being that he was a red-haired, freckle-faced, skinny, and a transfer who only showed up for a single year, it is no surprise he felt he had a hard time fitting in. It was also written that though he was described as a giant, he carried himself like someone who wishes to stay out of the way and go unnoticed. Still though, Robert had climbed the basketball recruiting rankings to nearly the top. He was a consensus top 15 high school recruit in the nation. 24-7 Sports had him ranked as the 8th best prospect in the class of 2004, ahead of the likes of fellow big men recruits LaMarcus Aldridge, Al Horford, and Joe Kim Noah. I did a video on LaMarcus Aldridge, so you should check that out, it's my most recent upload. There were a lot of people in the ears of Robert following the completion of his senior year. Coaches encouraged him to go to USC, where he could further develop his skill and put on the much needed strength needed to compete in the NBA, as keep in mind he was 18 years old, 7 foot 1, and weighed only 220 pounds. But money hungry agents and certain family members who were not looking out for Rob's best interest convinced him and his mother that he should make the leap of faith into the league. This was a decision that would change Robert's life forever. Gone were the days of playing pickup ball with his friends at the park and goofing off. Now it was real professional level training every day. Basketball was his job. As his senior year wound down, animosity grew between him and his mother up to graduation. In May of 2004, Robert ended up moving out of his family's home and in with a friend pretty much as soon as he could. He got his first of many tattoos at this time as well. Ink would become Rob's form of expression going forward in life. He may not look intimidating, but with tattoos and working out, he could at least put off the facade that he was. Whether he will ever admit that or not, that is my theory for why he kind of went down the path of getting a lot of tattoos. It may surprise you to hear that Rob did not attend the 2004 NBA Draft Combine. His agent worded it like this, Robert was an investment for the future. What he looked like then and there was not what mattered. They were hoping Rob could land on a team that would develop him into an NBA caliber center of the future. Leading up to draft night, Robert and his agent had had discussions with the Boston Celtics about him joining their team with their use of their 15th overall pick. Boston was coming off of a disappointing 2004 season, but had plenty of win-now talent revolving around prime Paul Pierce to make a push in 2005. It was expected that they would use their selection of Robert Swift as a long-term investment. He would not play a lot, but he would learn from experienced veterans and in a few years carry on the Boston legacy of a superstar big man. But to everyone's shock, Rob was taken 12th overall in the lottery by the Seattle Supersonics. A draft night move that neither Rob nor his agent were anticipating as they never even had serious discussions with the franchise. Seattle was in a similar situation to Boston. They are a contending team, they just had a bad season last year. They too viewed Rob as a long-term investment, but the issue was the goal was not shared throughout the franchise, especially with the head coach, Nate McMillan. He was on the camp of not wanting a project when he desperately needed wins in order to keep his job. His first conversation with Rob included a sarcastic, I'm looking forward to actually seeing you play. A testament to how he viewed the project of a seven-footer. He had virtually no idea who Rob was or how he would fit into the team. Right after being taken in the draft and signing his three-year $4.4 million contract, Rob's parents both quit working and declared bankruptcy 
for the second time in only five years. They also, like so many other NBA draft pick parents, were going to live off of their son's birth given abilities. They became a huge financial responsibility for Rob. His role changed from a student and son overnight to a millionaire breadwinner, and that's pretty hard for the rest of us to imagine. The 2005 NBA season got off to a very difficult start for Rob. Carrying over from high school, he was extremely shy amongst his teammates and coaches, barely ever saying a word at practice or in team meetings. Dwight Dobb, the team's strength coach, who Rob had a positive relationship with, was quoted saying, you had to pry words out of him. The 29-year-old all-star teammate and future Hall of Famer Ray Allen, when asked about Robert, said, At this stage in my career, I don't want to watch somebody take a couple of years to develop before they can help us win. Which was a perfectly fair thing to say at the time, but that's a pretty brutal take for the rookie to stomach. Rob was only 18 years old at the start of his first season, four years younger than the team's second youngest player, Luke Ridnauer so you can understand why he may have felt out of place there. But at the same time, this is a professional team. This was everybody's livelihood. They aren't guaranteed any income a year or two from now. They rightfully are not in a position to care about how this random rookie turns out in five to 10 years. They need to win games now in order to keep making money. The NBA G League, then called the D League, was not what it was now, so Rob was going to sit on the bench a lot this season. On October 23rd in a preseason game against the San Antonio Spurs, Rob matched up against superstar center and future Hall of Famer Tim Duncan. Although they did not share the court much, on this night Tim offered some advice to the young rookie that he would never forget. On the first possession the two matched up, Swift attempted to play physically with Duncan, but Tim calmly said, nah nah don't do that. The ball is going to swing to the other side, get in position. Then, as the ball was swung to the other side, Swift rotated. Duncan then corrected the rookie on the fly. No, further up, a little higher. Swift, a bit surprised as you could imagine, complied. Then, right before the ball was swung from the weak side back to the strong side, Duncan told him, All right, now come back. The ball's about to be swung back, but it's not coming to me this time, so don't worry about it. But now you know how to play it. This was a random moment of a preseason game almost lost completely to time. A type of moment Tim Duncan probably had with lots of young centers over the years. But it was one of the few moments to rob it during his rookie year where he actually felt genuinely looked out for by a veteran. And it was someone not even on his own team. In that moment, Rob decided that Tim Duncan was the type of player he wanted to become. Not necessarily on the court, but as a person and a mentor. From here though, Rob's rookie season went poorly. Through the first five games of the year, Rob had only managed 20 minutes of action, all in garbage time, scoring just three points and not grabbing even a single rebound. He then was sent to the end of the bench, only appearing sporadically from this point. By mid-April, he was averaging a shockingly low 0.3 points per game, but on the 20th of the month, in a game against the Houston Rockets, things got ugly early and as a result, Rob checked into the game in the third quarter. He would play a then career high 17 minutes in this one, and he produced career highs of 10 points on a perfect 4-4 shooting, while also grabbing 3 rebounds, and he managed a very impressive 4 blocked shots. It was a brief glimpse of the type of player scouts had envisioned he would become, a shot blocking efficient finisher who sets good screens and gobbles up rebounds. The dream center for a Seattle team that was especially weak in that category. But from this point on, Rob would not appear in a single additional game through the end of the season, finishing with averages of 0.9 points, 0.3 rebounds, and 0.4 blocks per game. Inarguably, this was the worst production of any lottery pick taken that year. Rob watched from the bench as his team lost in the second round of the playoffs to the very same San Antonio Spurs team that he admired. But it was not all doom and gloom in Rob's life. As mentioned earlier, though he did not communicate well with his older teammates, Rob did have success meeting and mingling with his own peers at the local colleges in and around Seattle. Being a teenage, generous millionaire and pro athlete, Rob had become very popular off the court, leading to him living almost a double life, the quiet NBA half people saw on TV, and the outgoing personal half his friends grew to know. 
Rob matured a good bit both physically and mentally during the summer of 2005, and as a result, he entered the NBA season in far better condition than the previous one. Still though, he was at very best a third string center for a team looking to compete. Plus, the team used their 2005 first round pick to select another 20 year old center in Johan Petro. And a new head coach, Rob Weiss, just like the previous coach, was in no mood to develop a project when his job was on the line. Because of all this, through 30 games, Rob only managed to appear in 24 minutes of action. And they were all in garbage time. At this point, the team was a lackluster 14 and 16, so the front office decided to change the direction of the franchise. Three veteran bigs were dealt away to open up minutes at the five, and the head coach was replaced with Bob Hill, a coach that Rob would have a very positive relationship with. From this point on, Rob was not only in the regular rotation, but he even got the nod to be the team's starting center at times. In his first career start on January 22nd, Rob played a career-high 38 minutes in a double overtime thriller victory over the Phoenix Suns. He chipped in a career-high 15 points along with 7 rebounds. Leaving a terrific first impression with the front office, coaches, and fan base, they then decided to keep him in the starting lineup. In the very next game, he managed a career-high 12 rebounds plus blocked 2 shots in a blowout victory over the Utah Jazz. Two games later in his fourth start, the Sonics would defeat the New Jersey Nets in a game where Rob would tally his first career double-double, putting up 14 points and 12 rebounds while blocking two shots. Then on February 10th, he grabbed a career-high 13 rebounds in a victory over the Atlanta Hawks. Unfortunately, the good times did eventually come to an end, as on February 15th, Rob would break his nose, meaning he'd be ending his streak in the starting lineup. During this 14 game run though, he managed to average 8 points, 8 rebounds, and a very impressive 1.9 blocks per game, shooting 55% from 2. This was by far the best stretch of games for the now 20 year old center. After making his return to the team on March 24th, Rob would put up a career high 17 points, along with 11 rebounds and blocking 4 shots coming off the bench against the Denver Nuggets. Swift ended the season appearing in 47 games, averaging a respectable 6 points, 5 rebounds, and 1.2 blocks per game. The team missed the playoffs, but things were looking up for the young center. During the summer of 2006, Rob would embrace his tough guy persona, reinventing himself from the ground up. He purchased a $1.3 million mansion east of Seattle alongside a beautiful lake. He began collecting firearms, motorcycles, cars, and even reptiles. He also changed his physical appearance both in the weight room by putting on more muscle as well as covering his body in even more tattoos and growing out his bright red hair to give himself a look unlike anyone else in the league. During training camp, there was a lot of buzz around the new and improved Robert Swift. He was throwing down impressive dunks, contesting shots at the rim, and nailing his passes from the post to shooters around the arc. Even after a minor hip injury right before the first preseason game, he had played himself into being the sure thing opening night starting center. Three years in and Rob appeared to be destined to be the player that everyone had dreamed of. But on October 25th, in their second to last preseason game, Rob would injure his knee one minute into action. Though this was initially listed as a strain, then upgraded to a sprain, it was eventually diagnosed to be a torn ACL, meaning Rob would be forced to undergo surgery and miss the entire 2007 NBA season. A devastating blow, but still something his coaches tried their best to remind him was not going to be a career ender. It was at this point where Rob's life began to head down a path that makes you concerned. He travels with the team, he rests his body, and he rehabs his knee. Those are all the duties of his contractual obligations, but mentally the injury took a major toll on him. Rob was left with a ton of free time to sit around with his college age friends he made in the area and spend money. His mansion becomes the hotspot for parties and Rob continued the bad habit of refusing to say no to his friends and family, spending who knows how much money on other people out of generosity, but also out of self-imposed obligation. He was a millionaire basketball player, which yeah, technically that's correct, but the money was being spent very fast. 
Despite what had happened, the Sonics had accepted Rob's team option for 2008 early in his recovery. And he had worked hard off the court and successfully gotten himself healthy and back into game shape. This year, the Supersonics did not have win-out expectations, and new head coach PJ Carlissimo and the front office were primarily focused on further developing their young players, especially their second overall pick, Kevin Durant. Rob himself was still only 21 years old at the start of the year. He was looking for a bounce back sort of campaign. On November 4th, Rob finally made his long awaited return to the court in a game against the LA Clippers, although he did not produce a whole lot, only scoring 2 points and 15 minutes of action. The coaching staff made a questionable decision here to move him into the starting lineup the very next game though. In this game, Rob once again only managed 2 points, but did at the very least block a couple shots as well. Swift played five total games through November 11th before being put on the inactive list though due to a continued knee soreness. He would not join the active roster again until January 5th, but only appear in garbage time of three games before on February 21st when he would tear the meniscus of his previously injured knee. This ended Rob's season right then and there. What should have been his fourth, but actually his third, NBA year, Rob played in only eight games, averaging one point two rebounds and 0.8 blocks per game. Now, meniscus injuries are not nearly as devastating as ACL tears, but given this was the same knee as the last time, Rob's recovery was going to need to be taken very slowly. Interestingly, the Sonics had not given up on Rob just yet. They offered him a $3.5 million contract with one year guaranteed, and he graciously accepted it. The team also at this time, if you're curious, moved to Oklahoma City and changed their name to the Thunder, which is the team you guys know today, probably. Robert Swift adopted what he later referred to as a screw-it-all attitude towards not only basketball, but his life in general during his time in Oklahoma. He would experience injury after injury, some minor, some severe, all year long. He started some games, then spent entire weeks watching from the bench. Off the court, the stresses of his downward spiraling NBA career led to him increasing his partying and drinking to a staggering amount. He also further embraced his unique style, cutting his hair into a long floppy mohawk, getting even more tattoos, and he even started painting his nails black. Nobody in the NBA looks like this. When the season came to an end, there was not a whole lot to be happy about. Rob had only managed to appear in 26 games, averaging 3 points, 3 rebounds, and 0.7 blocks a night. During the summer of 2009, Swift's downward spiral began to amplify. It is not clear at what point he moved on from simply drinking to harder drugs, but either way, Rob showed up to Summer League noticeably heavier and slower than he ever did before. In a span of a few short months, he had gone from tone and jacked to soft and flabby. The former lottery pick was offered a look by the franchise that initially promised to give him his first shot at the league, the Boston Celtics at that year's summer league. But these games came and went with little to speak of. Rob was okay, but he wasn't good enough to warrant extending an offer to, and he ended up finishing the summer as a free agent. Prior to the start of the 2010 basketball season, Rob was sitting at home in his mansion in Seattle without direction. His life had fallen apart. The millions he had made were almost gone. His friends all moved on with their lives, and his coping methods turned into crippling addiction. He was too embarrassed and ashamed to show his face around his loved ones. Right after he thought everything was falling in on him, his hometown minor league team extended him an offer. Rob would move back to California to train with the Bakersfield Jam in preparation for their D-League season. The D-League at this time had NBA players in it, yes, but nothing like it is today. There were no two ways, actual players were not sent down to get court time, and honestly, very few franchises considered signing D-Leaguers. It was an investment by the NBA, which today has turned into something great, but at the time it was nothing more than a few part-time basketball players playing in front of chairs, praying that somebody somewhere was actually watching. When Rob showed up, he was up to 350 pounds, which is an entire 100 pounds heavier than he was when he was on the Thunder. Though it is speculated that at this time he was abusing drugs, he did hide it from his team and he went through the motions of being a professional at least pretty well, 
His coaches admired his work ethic leading up to the season and recognized he was far more skilled than just about anyone else in the league. But mentally, it was very apparent he was not all the way there. After only appearing in two games producing very little, largely due to how out of shape he was, Rob had a meeting with his coach and broke the news to him that he was going to leave the team and turn his focus to a career of MMA. It is really not clear how honest of a future goal this MMA thing actually was as Rob never actually appeared in any octagons. But what is clear is that from here, Rob would vanish from the public eye for an extended period of time. Rob and his brief fling girlfriend split around this time, meaning he would be adding child support to his list of expenses every month on his non-existent salary. 5000 a month to be exact. Rob would spiral in his home during the basketball season of 2010, but in July, he received a phone call from one of his old coaches. Hill had been offered the job to coach in the Japanese B-League for the Tokyo Apache, and he wanted to give Rob a run with his new team. While in Japan, things began turning around for Rob. He played himself into shape, he was never a problem on or off the floor, and he was, as his coaches put it, generous to a fault, always picking up the tabs for teammates and coaches at restaurants. Rob began to open up while in Japan. His confidence is not only returning, but increasing. He drops a 22.18 rebound game one night, then follows it up with a 21.16 rebound game the next. In Tokyo, Rob played 35 games, averaging 13 points, 10 rebounds, and 1.7 blocks per game, while shooting 61% from the field, and even sprinkling in a few three-point shots. Rob had reinvented himself and the love of basketball was returning. NBA teams started calling. But on March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9 earthquake rocked the country of Japan, devastating cities, killing tens of thousands and putting life at a pause for the peaceful island nation. Rob's Tokyo Apache completely folded due to the devastation caused by the earthquake and the league ended prematurely. Rob would be forced to return to the United States, leaving behind a life he never knew he wanted, but now he yearned so heavily to go back to. Rob's B-League escapades did not go unnoticed in the NBA, as I said earlier. Several teams were itching to add him to their summer league roster as soon as he made it back stateside. He ended up signing on to join with the Portland Trailblazers in Las Vegas for the summer league. The franchise was eager to add a now hardened and experienced center as a backup as they looked to compete. But in another twist of fate, the NBA lockout began shortly thereafter. The Blazers broke the news to him that they would be waiving him to direct their focuses elsewhere. The fragility of a career in sports is not something easily understood. At one moment, you think you'll be living it up for the next 10 to 15 years, playing basketball, living a life of luxury, until you decide when you want to enjoy an early retirement and ride off into the sunset. Then in the next moment, it all comes crashing down and you find yourself sitting at home with nothing but your thoughts. Not only that, but you have your family members, friends, and agents, whether they realize it or not, on your case like you cannot even begin to imagine. People do not understand how mentally taxing it is to deal with the uncertainty of a professional career in sports. I say all of this to help you understand why things went the way they did from here. Rob once again evaded the public eye for an extended period of time, but this time he slipped down the path of harder drugs. There is no sugarcoating it, Rob became an H addict. His entire life morphed into one where the only thing he could think about was getting his next hit. Every year, around a million Americans find themselves battling with H addiction, and at least a 10,000 or so will pass as a result of it. It is a drug that not only leaves you powerless, but it possesses addictive qualities that grow stronger and stronger with time. It is said that withdrawals leave people in a sick heap in an unbearable agony as their body quite literally begs them for the drug. It is very easy to look on from the outside and say, if it hurts you, then don't do it. But the reality of these victims' mental states is that it stops being a choice very early on as it grows into a true sickness. I'm not going to be able to convince you of the epidemic of H abuse in the United States in just this one little video. If you're skeptical of it or you just want to do more research, please do it. But also, please be considerate in the comments down below if you feel inclined to give your thoughts. 
Every person who has an addiction to drugs knows it. It is not as simple as putting the drug down and going on a walk to smell some flowers. The real world can be a very dark place. Between 2011 and 2014, Rob falls apart further. He spends days without sleep, barely eating, just using H to help him not feel anything. People enter his life with nefarious aspirations to use his generosity as a way of boosting their illegal business. When the bank foreclosed on Rob's home, television crews were called to document just how appalling the interior of his home had become. Alcohol bottles lay all over the place. Pizza boxes were stacked high and there was trash all over the ground. They even found boxes full of letters and journals that belonged to Rob. Letters from universities and coaches who had wanted and supported him. People he felt he let down in an irreparable way. Journals where Rob cataloged his thoughts over the years as a way of both battling with and trying to regain control of his own psyche. Reporters from the Seattle Times spent months trying to track down Rob, but to the surprise of everyone, he is nowhere to be found. He does not wish to be seen or heard from ever again. But eventually, in October of 2014, Rob would resurface. He had been arrested in a drug bust for a notorious dealer in the Seattle area. Rob had been living with the dealer and helping him as a bodyguard and general heavy lifter. Rob was officially booked with a charge for unlawful possession of an illegal firearm, of all things. The police interviews with the dealer were very telling about the person Rob was at this stage in his life. He told reporters Swift was a good guy who had nothing to do with the drug dealing, going on to say he was only there to clean up the place and help keep the bad people out. It was clear in their conversations that Rob and this man had a good relationship with a lot of trust in one another. Rob was not like the junkies, as he put it, who frequented his home. Rob had a reason to keep living. He felt he did not. Rob is released with a pending court date and finds himself homeless. Sleeping in the now deserted home of his former dealer with no power or running water, Rob seemingly has hit rock bottom. But he is still himself. Rob yearns for relationships. He, like all of us, just wants to have people in his life who he can count on and who can hopefully count on him. In a twist I am sure will surprise a lot of you, over the coming weeks Rob would befriend a 78 year old woman who lived next door. She and he would talk the days away, he helps her with chores around the home, and he gives her what he can. Things like a signed basketball for example. In return for Rob's kindness and friendship, she invites him over for dinner, and she lets him run an extension cord over to his current home. He has nothing in this home but a waffle maker, a TV, a DVD player, and a copy of the movie Transformers to his name. Unfortunately, Rob would spiral again from here and move in with another dealer, this time upping his usage from just H to include how he later described it, an unhealthy amount of M. In January 2015, Rob, after missing some court dates, is found high out of his mind attempting to rob a house. He is arrested and put in jail, awaiting sentencing for the weapons charge and court evading. For well over a week, Rob remembers nothing but lying on his cold metal bed, shivering and puking, while fighting the withdrawals. He spent most of his time in jail in and out of consciousness. But as time goes on, he comes out of it, and he learns to live life behind bars. He very quickly becomes popular within the jail, with just about everyone he comes in contact with. Everyone wants to hear stories about what it was like being in the NBA, and he starts to feel more like himself with each passing day. He eventually makes a checklist of things he hopes to accomplish once he's let go. He plans to become the father he was supposed to be. He wants to continue learning Japanese, hinting at a dream of one day returning to the country he loved and he makes a point to keep making new goals for the future. After getting out of jail, Rob makes a point to repair the relationship he has lost with his younger brother, Alex. The two have lived very different lives. Rob, seven foot one, hardened, covered in tats, no money to his name, no driver's license, spent years playing professional basketball and just got out of jail. Alex, only a year younger, but an entire foot shorter, happily married. When the two rekindled, Rob was horrifyingly underweight. His ribs protruded, and the big, full muscles he once had were nearly completely gone. Apparently, Rob 
was barely over the malnutrition line. Therefore, he was not offered any extra food while in jail. Which is ridiculous when you think about it. Jailhouse meals are designed to sustain a 5 foot 11 inch man, not someone the size of Rob. Over the coming months, Rob makes considerable improvements in his life. He does spend a few days in jail, but he goes to therapy, he makes himself useful at his brother's home, and he changes himself. One of his projects was completely redoing his brother's backyard, displaying an unknown skill he had hiding in the form of gardening. Rob eventually returns to playing basketball in his church rec league with his brother. Here, he finds himself falling back in love with the sport of basketball, a feeling that he has felt very infrequently over the past decade. More time passes, Rob continues to get back in shape, and he finds the skills he once had. Plus, he adds that outside shot. After living out of hotel rooms and fast food while traveling around with multiple semi-pro teams across the U.S., Rob is offered an opportunity to join the newly formed Circulo Guillon, a team... By the way, if I pronounce that wrong, I'm sorry. A team that plays in the Spanish LEB third tier. This isn't the NBA, nor is it even the G League, but it is the opportunity he has been waiting for. Now at 33 years old, Rob manages 9 points, 4 rebounds, and a block per game in 34 contests. Not a spectacular output he may have dreamed of to get him back to the NBA, but something he can be proud of. After being away from the team for a while, Rob was brought back in January of 2020 to help them make a push down the stretch. Here he played sparingly, managing only 6 points, 4 rebounds, and 0.4 blocks per game. But as it always had, the world decided to intervene in Rob's success, and in March 2020, the global pandemic started, which put an end to the season early. Rob would suit up one more season, though, with Guillaume, this time putting up 3 points, 2 rebounds per game. It seems everything was said and done. Rob was officially retiring from basketball and putting an end to his goals of getting back into the NBA. Today, it is not clear where the now 38-year-old Robert Swift is. He seems to have fallen back out of the public eye and into obscurity. This time around, though, he seems to be staying positive. Rob had a tough life, and I would not wish it on any young player, but I feel as though his story is one that needs to be told. Rob is a good kind-hearted man who was always in over his head and taken advantage of. He spent time at rock bottom and he climbed out a better person. Thank you guys for watching this video. It was a long one and I apologize if my narration was a little bit shaky. I'm a little under the weather, but I did my best to fight through it. Please leave comments down below on your thoughts on the story of Robert Swift. Subscribe if you want to stick with this channel to see more basketball content. And I will see you all next time.